prepare to embark on a journey into the depth of your own emotions in this video, where a delicate dance unfolds between control and chaos. We will unravel the secrets of taming the three most powerful forces that shape our lives. Discover how to harness the fiery essence of anger, transform impatience into unwavering focus and willpower, and conquer the crippling grip that fear has over our lives. Because these three emotions, pretty much, if you master these three emotions, you will learn how to not get manipulated, how to overcome problems, how to date and attract the right person, how to leave the wrong person, how to tackle career goals, and how to tackle challenges. And these and these are the emotions that, me, my, in my opinion, I've learned to control. And I'm not going to lie, especially the first one, it has completely changed my life. So let's begin with the video. And if you like this type of content, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And let me know what other emotions I did not cover in this video that you think I should have. And don't forget, we're having 50% off all of our courses using the coupon code mindful and it ends in january 1st so let's begin with the video so let's begin with impatience right because impatience is the number one source of our biggest mistakes i mean i'm not even kidding with you um if, for example when i started doing art i learned art pretty fast and i learned that in three or four years like how to learn how to paint realistically and this was my strategy learn slowly if i want to learn fast learn slowly if i want to learn slow learn fast that's what i've noticed okay so p impatience is the biggest cause of failure why because human this is our this is part of human nature to be impatient um we want to we want quick fixes we want instant gratification this week this is a weakness because we then make big mistakes with little thinking and based on what we want in the moment so many mistakes, so many mistakes come because of lack of impatience. And one of the things that people do is that they understand that human nature is impatient. So what they do to make you make mistakes is to make you impatient. Like a partner pulling away and not responding and forcing you to feel impatient. Like somebody making you wait. All of those things cause you to lose your focus and your control. Where when you get impatience, you stop thinking long term and you start you start thinking about the short term. By not being patient, you limit all of your options. And in relationships, we do the same as well. So when you want something now, but what's good for you is going to come tomorrow, you're limiting your options, right? Patience allows you to let opportunities come to you. If you know, it's like, it's like a spider. A spider's strategy for survival is patience, creating a web, making it right, making it tight, and just waiting, right? If you know how to use time and, and observe your environment, you have the most powerful tool, which is thinking into the future and formulating a plan based on that understanding. Why Moving first, initiating the attack, will often put you at a disadvantage. You are exposing your strategy and limiting your options. Instead, discover the power of holding back and letting the other side move first giving you the flexibility to counterattack from any angle. If your opponents are aggressive, bait them into a rash attack that will leave them in a weak position. Learn to use their impatience, their eagerness to get at you, as a way to throw them off balance and bring them down. In difficult moments, do not despair or retreat. Any situation can be turned around. If you learn how to hold back, waiting for the right moment to launch an unexpected counterattack, weakness can become strength. Because patience prevents you from making all of the dumb mistakes that we've talked about. People then, because of that, people then are drawn, because of our natural impatience, we are drawn to quick fixes, the easy fix. Because this is the thing, most of this game is all about patience. It really is. And if you don't know if you can't control your compulsive need to act whenever you feel uncertain, whenever you feel like you want the answers right now because we've been conditioned to get instant gratification, people back then, people used to send letters and wait weeks for a response. That, that's how romance was back in the days. It used to be a lot slower. So they were able to wait longer period of time. They were they had more tolerance for waiting. Nowadays, some if someone takes a whole day to respond, we're we're apoplectic and you're calling me thinking I'm black Jesus, thinking I could just magically bring bring them back. Right? But you gotta understand is that the real default mode of dating for humans 
is a slow process. And that slow process goes against our natural inclinations for quick gratification. So what, so what somebody who might be trying to manipulate you, they'll do, they'll just make you wait because that's the, that's your weakness. You, you want a response. Humans do not like, um, lose strengths. So you develop that through meditation because if you can't wait, I'm telling you, like I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if you don't know how to wait, if you do not know how to wait, you're, you're asking for trouble. If you, if you don't know how to wait, plain and simple and any good any good player, quote unquote, male or, f male or female, it's just going to make you wait. That's, that's pretty much the whole strategy. Quick fixes, the easy fix, either through watching others succeed and rooting for them, right? That's another, that's another way of us to, of not doing things where we live vicariously through celebrities and through our children, or by buying into quick fixes and quick elixirs and looking for quick boosts of dopamine and technology and etc. All of those things are forms of impatience where you're bored and tired and depressed and rather than just sitting with the boredom and trying to find a way to get out of that boredom, entertain yourself through using your mind, we then focus on f watching TV shows and looking for quick fixes of entertainment. Where back then, in the, um, when before we had technology like electronics, you had to think your way out of impatience. You had to think your way out of boredom. And that actually allowed, that actually trained your mind to become stronger and to become more um to become more what's that word um resilient right like we learning how to get out of boredom and and, and and impatience through natural means makes us grow but rather we are we have trained ourselves to just go for the internet go for quick fixes even watching my videos in conquering something in learning a skill you have to do it over and over and over and over again and if you just are in the moment, you're just frustrated and you're bored, you're going to give up. But if your attention is, this is going to give me so much rewards, then you're looking three months down the road and then it's not boring. It's a challenge. And you know that eventually you're going to be playing chess like a grandmaster. It's going to be fun, more fun than any video game that anybody could ever invent. So that's the key thing is, is do you have that pattern early in your life where you understand that boredom and tedium is actually something to overcome. And when you overcome it, amazing things will happen. The addiction to instant results and information um, has an effect on every aspect of our lives. We want things fast and we don't have the patience for them. So that means people learn skills by half-ass. People um, learn how to meditate by half-ass. Anything that you don't give all of your patience to, you don't learn fully, right? But what we don't realize is how that affects our thinking. Things, to, things tend to be amplified whenever we just narrow our focus to the things in the moment. But that tends to make people make decisions on little things in the moment. The way to deal with this is twofold. On one, develop patience, which is something that takes time. Learn to think long term and base your decisions on the long term, that vision that you have. Everyone around you is a strategist angling for power, all trying to promote their own interests, often at your expense. Your daily battles with them make you lose sight of the only thing that really matters, victory in the end, the achievement of greater goals, lasting power. Grand strategy is the art of looking beyond the battle and calculating ahead. It requires that you focus on your ultimate goal and plot to reach it. In grand strategy, you consider the political ramifications and long-term consequences of what you do. Instead of reacting emotionally to people, you take control and make your actions more dimensional, subtle, and effective. Let others get caught up in the twists and turns of the battle, relishing their little victories. Grand strategy will bring you the ultimate reward, the last laugh. Right? So. The first thing about patience is having a long-term vision and wanting that long-term vision. That wanting of the long-term vision naturally comes with patience. And then you got to stop looking out at where everyone is compared to you. That will also cause you to feel impatient. This will give you the clarity to deal with overreactions of your emotions and of others. And the last thing is to have faith, faith that things will turn right if you are patient.
So the last thing is having faith in the process. Now you might say, Alexis, I don't like that process. I don't like that style. What's another way to develop patience? Because again, impatience is the number one source of our mistakes. One of the things is just develop a meditation practice on a daily basis. Like for me, every day I either meditate for one hour or 30 minutes, but every day I meditate 30 minutes in the morning or one hour, one of the two. What that does is that you're sitting your butt down and you're waiting for it to be 30 minutes. And in that time, you might feel impatient. That impatience that you feel is the same impatience you might feel whenever you want something to happen now, right? Because the brain doesn't just create feeling of impatience with just meditation and then creates the unique feeling of impatience for relationships. No, it's the same impatience. So if you're able to overcome the feeling of impatience when you meditate, then that feeling of impatience that you have overcame will not come up in other areas of your life. So just focus on developing a meditation practice and patience will come will become cultivated over time. So that's the first thing, um, developing a deep meditation process. Um, the next one is um, anger. Anger, like I said in my previous video, how anger is a woman is a is a woman's and a man's secret weapon, is that anger allows you to defend yourself. Anger, controlled anger, is the source of your defenses, is your internal bodyguard. It is anger that you feel whenever somebody bullies your child. It is anger that you feel whenever somebody tries to play you. It is anger that you feel whenever there's some form of injustice. So it's the same thing here. Anger will be your bodyguard, and a lot of people are devo devoid of that feeling. Some people feel too much anger, but some people feel no anger. And when you don't have anger, you tend to forget the things that people do to you. You tend to forgive too quickly. You tend to take people back without making them pay a consequence. You tend to have little respect for yourself because anger is what's going to give you the desire to defend yourself. That It's that simple. Because the opposite of anger that people deal with then is learned helplessness rather than do something about it because anger is, a, is, the, is, the, is the frustration when you can't control something. Rather than when you can't control it, then people then become um, develop learned helplessness. But also, anger comes in the form of you personalizing things. For example, when something doesn't go your way, you get angry at the phone and you almost feel like the phone is a person anger gives life to things that are dead that tends to internally attack you so my phone is dead my phone is not working right or better yet my phone died right when i needed it and we just feel like it was on purpose we feel like this phone let us down we feel legit resentment for an inanimate object legit and that's really a projection that's really you being frustrated with yourself so whenever you feel that anger when you get at, mad at, at, a, at a store clerk when you get mad at a situation ask yourself why am i really angry am i really angry about that situation because when you are angry without thinking you tend to project a lot i literally project that life onto a phone when you're angry at someone, you can dehumanize someone, like 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 the war with Gaza and, and Israel, right? There's a lot of dehumanizations on both sides, right? I don't know who's right or wrong, but I'm just saying I know when I see dehumanization, when I see it, I know the behavior, you know. So that's one thing. When you when your anger causes you to personalize things, get make enemies out of people, and that makes a problem. That creates a problem. You pay a greater price for being so nice and deferential than for consciously showing your shadow, realize that at times you must offend and even hurt people who block your path, who have ugly values, who unjustly... Even if you like them, which is the hardest part. This is easy to think about when we are not thinking of somebody that we love, but when we think of somebody, somebody that we love, all of a sudden we sort of feel a resistance emerging from our hearts. ...they criticize you. Use such moments of clear injustice to bring out your shadow and show it proudly. When Norman Mailer first met her in 1960 and she seemed to poke fun at him, he saw that something droll and hard came into her eyes as if she were a very naughty eight-year-old indeed. And what's funny is that that naughty um, side or, people, or you getting annoyed by people, you usually hide it. And little do we know that by showing our annoyance, people end up liking us more, which is just, you know what I'm saying? Like me, I'm somebody who tries to hide when you're bothering me, you know, cause I don't like to make people feel bad. But I do notice that when somebody expresses that I'm bothering them, there is an unconscious desire to make it up to them. You know what I'm saying? 
And and I I think a lot of people feel that way. It's not just me.、Mm-hmm. When people displeased her, she showed it rather openly. She seemed to care little what others thought of her. Yeah, it's it's so important to learn to be okay with showing dislike of people. <laughs> you know, like it's it's not the end of the world. In fact, people respect you for that.、Um, a lot of the times, we hide our our dislike of people and, and we're polite with them.、Um, and what I've noticed in my life is that. There is nothing wrong with showing dislike. In fact, people respect you for it. In fact, people who you dislike might even like you for it. <laughs> yeah, that's what usually happens, man. They get more annoying. And she became a sensation because of the naturalness she exuded. In general, consider this a form of exorcism. Once you show these desires and impulses. They no longer lie hidden in corners of your personality,、uh-huh. twisting and operating in secret ways. You're just releasing it, like how how when people when cows have too much methane inside of them, they put something in here, and it causes the methane to be released so that they're not bloated, right?、Um, and it's the same thing. Like they literally pull a hole so that it could like a fucking balloon. It's crazy.、Um, And this is pretty much the same thing. Like we're just bloated with anger. With we're, we're bloated because, you see, the bloating happens when we feel like we can't control things. That's what happens when you feel like you have no control over your life. It makes you angry. Anger comes when you can't control something. And learning to let go and learning to release control releases you of your anger. But unfortunately, before the complete release happens, you have to feel your anger to a certain degree. You know, and the next thing is that when you are angry and you don't control your anger, you tend to do things that are outside of your character. When you're in a group setting and everyone is angry, you're gonna feel that anger, and you might join the mob, do things that you usually don't do, especially in the group setting. Because when you're in a group setting, your you, your personality is lost. Your exaggerated self comes out. Your dark side comes out, actually. So when you're angry and 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 You try to take action from a place of anger. It's always the wrong decision. It's always the wrong decision. The first part that I talked to you about, about contr-、uh, using your anger to create boundaries, it's more controlled anger. This is uncontrollable anger. The type of anger where you black out. And the way to develop that, the way to fix that, like I said, the part of your brain that's angry is your limbic system, your 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 um. Your limbic brain system, the, the the deeper part. I forgot what's it called, right?、Um, yeah. Anyway, so that part is just overactive, and when that that's overactive, your frontal cortex isn't as active. It's actually hijacked by your limbic brain. And like I say, what's the number one thing that lowers the activity of your limbic system and increases、um, gray matter to your prefrontal cortex so that you're able to think more rationally? Watching my videos. I'm kidding. Meditation. Meditation will give you the rationality and the physiology to control your anger because it it, sh- it shrinks the activity of the limbic system and it increases the activity of, of your frontal cortex. In other words, you're gonna be able to think more clearly when you're angry. If you can't control your anger, you're gonna say things that's gonna offend people. You're gonna lose friends. You're just it's just gonna be really bad people. So that's one thing that's very important: controlling your anger. Um, and the last thing is fear, controlling your fear. You gotta understand, all of us have basic emotions, right? Where we have anger, we have fear, we have sad, we have depression, right? And our body does not create new emotions, right? So the fear that you feel, there's like a ball of fear inside of everyone, and the body uses, the brain uses. Takes chunks out of that fear, depending on the situation. So let's just say you feel fear, and you have the fear emotions within you, and then something, and then you get a something comes up, and you don't know whether or not you pass the test. Right? The body realizes that this is not a big threat, but it needs to feel some form of anxiety. So it takes a little bit of the fear that you already have, and gives it to that situation. So you feel a little bit anxious. Right? Now what? Is that what is that ball of feeling? What does that come from? Actually, that ball of feeling is what your fe- is what you're gonna feel in its complete form before you die. It's the fear that you feel 
of the fear of death that's that ball the fear of death and so the body because that's the ultimate fear that's the that that's really what every other organism is trying to avoid is trying to avoid death so the body has a certain amount of fear of death and then it uses 20 percent for this type of situation 20 percent, but it's all but it all comes from the same place so rather than asking yourself how do i stop being afraid of taking risk how do i stop being afraid of my parents how do i stop being afraid of the bully rather than asking you're asking you're almost asking how do i remove the tip of this iceberg the way to remove overall fear is to remove the ultimate fear, which is the fear of death. Once you Most of us spend our lives avoiding the thought of death. Instead, the inevitability of death should be continually on our minds. Understanding the shortness of life fills us with a sense of purpose and urgency to realize our goals. Training ourselves to confront and accept this reality makes it easier to manage the inevitable setbacks, separations, and crises in life. It gives us a sense of proportion of what really matters in this brief existence of ours. Most people continually look for ways to separate themselves from others and feel superior. Instead, we must see the mortality in everyone, how it equalizes and connects us all. By becoming deeply aware of our mortality, we intensify our experience of every aspect of life. Once you overcome fear of death, everything else is easier because really that fear is meant for death. If you learn to be comfortable with the fear of death, all of a sudden that you won't be afraid no more. So now whenever it's time for you to feel afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow, there's not going to be any, there's not going to be emotions like th that emotion is not there. So the only thing that's going to draw upon is just peace. So get at the root of that fear. Observe, meditate on your common mortality. I know it sounds very weird, but it is true. If you just meditate on how you're going to die and all the different ways that you're going to die and, and get in touch with other people's reality of, of death, of how other people died or, or imagine or see the life of people who were young and realize that they died one day, get comfortable with the thought of death, get comfortable and feel how it is to age. When you see younger people, imagine them being old. When you see your older people, imagine them being young. When you see a city that's completely filled, imagine it compl being completely empty because everyone died, right? What the point is, is that you wanna get comfortable with that reality. Out of fear, we convert death into an abstraction, a thought we can entertain now and then or repress. But life is not a thought. It is a flesh and blood reality, something we feel from within. There is no such thing as life without death. Our mortality is just as much a flesh and blood reality as life. From the moment we are born, it is a presence within our bodies as our cells die and we age. We need to experience it this way. We should not see this as something morbid or terrifying. Moving past this block of ours in which death is an abstraction has an immensely liberating effect connecting us more physically to the world around us and heightening our senses. Once you get comfortable with that one day you will die, everything else is easier. You're comfortable with failing because it's not death. You're comfortable with what's going to happen tomorrow because you already accepted the, most, the, the biggest, the, the biggest um, fear that we all have, which is fear of death. Let me give you guys a story of what happens when you allow yourself to accept death as, as the ultimate reality. This story is from, is what happened to Theodore Dostoevsky. And this story is part of Robert Greene's book, The Laws of Human Nature. Let me show you guys what that was. It's very interesting. And it is something that you guys have to apply in your lives, unfortunately. <laughs> in December of 1849, the 27-year-old writer, Theodore Dostoevsky, imprisoned for participating in an alleged conspiracy against the Russian Tsar, found himself and his fellow prisoners suddenly transported to a square in St. Petersburg and told that they were about to be executed for their crimes. At that moment, all of the blood starts going down to your feet and you just feel cold, right? When that happens, your, your, your brain chemistry literally changes. It transforms you. Nothing alters all of your neural chemistry more than the thought of you dying. <laughs> like it is the moment when your brain is most plastic it is the moment when you can literally change in an instant 
because trauma, deep, intense feeling, makes the brain more moldable, like a like wax that's warm. You can move it around. But once it once it gets cooler, once the trauma leaves, once the fear or deep emotions subside, then you return to your unmalleable and more stubborn state of mind. This death sentence was totally unexpected. Dostoevsky had only a few minutes to prepare himself before he faced the firing squad. In those few minutes, emotions he had never felt before came rushing in. He noticed the rays of light hitting the dome of a cathedral and saw that all life was as fleeting as those rays. Everything seemed more vibrant to him. He noticed the expressions on his fellow prisoners' faces and how he could see the terror behind their brave facades. It was as if their thoughts and feelings had become transparent. Mm -hmm. At the last moment, a representative from the czar rode into the square, announcing that... The Which, in reality, that was like his whole, his whole plan, was to just scare them. Sentences had been commuted to several years' hard labor in Siberia. Damn. Utterly overwhelmed by his psychological brush with death, Dostoevsky felt reborn and the experience remained embedded in him for the rest of his life, inspiring new depths of empathy and intensifying his observational powers. Yeah. This has been the experience of others who have been exposed to death in a deep and personal way. Can and, and, and that's the power of it. Um, if you really want to change as a person for the positive, um, almost die, and you'll notice. <laughs> so when you accept this reality, this fear, accepting death, allows you to see the world through the eyes of death and seeing the world through the eyes of death there is no fear people there is no fear and let me show you guys a poem that i wrote um a few a few months ago with the help of a friend people okay i, I like to write it but i get i get help from a friend he likes to write poetry too and this is what i and i got this poem after listening to the book after reading the book the death of ivan eilich by leo tolstoy it's a beautiful book by the way but this was inspired by him let me show you seeing the world through the eyes of death allows us to perceive things as they truly are with an intensity that cuts through illusions it's akin to watching footage of loved ones who have passed away, evoking a bittersweet longing. Death adds a haunting beauty, revealing the underlying physical reality of our destiny that we often choose to deny. Being aware of our mortality enables us to embrace the raw reality and miraculous brevity of life. We are able to dance with life the songs that death whispers to us. It mirrors the profound experience we will all face in our final moments where heightened consciousness emerges as we cling to our remaining time in this world, where we see people's faces for who they really are, sense the true essence of the consciousness of our loved ones, and see the world as one through the brotherhood of death. Without the constraints of ego, we absorb the world and amplify its impact. This reality is available to us at every moment, inviting us to contemplate our existence and discover deeper truths to feel at ease at the thought of our separation with the physical world. It asks us to listen and to sense the fleeting nature of ourselves and our loved ones. The world we live in offers us our countless perspectives to see the world through, numerous realities to experience. You can see the world as a child, as an adult, as a villain, as a hero. However, viewing the world through the eyes of death represents the ultimate reality, the closest proximity to the essence of truth. Similar to how gravity distorts time through the eyes of death, there's no distortion of reality from the ego. It allows us to see things as if it were our last encounter, bringing us eyeball to eyeball without flinching with the nature of reality itself and finding peace in our mortality. Death. Conquer that fear of death through meditation, through meditation process. Because when you, and this is I always say, go to a 10-day retreat. When you, when you go to a 10-day retreat, you realize your ego doesn't exist. And the fear of death goes away when your ego realizes that it doesn't exist. And the way to do that is just to observe your thoughts because your ego is made out of your thoughts. Keep looking at your thoughts. Keep observing your thoughts. Look at it. You literally just start looking at your thoughts through observing your through observing the, the breath. You start looking at your thoughts through observing the breath. And you start noticing and feeling and sensing how holographic our thoughts are. Once you get to that point, 
you'll notice you they'll, they'll come a sense of like liberation and also you feel a little uncomfortable because you don't feel how you used to feel no more you stop feeling like the person who you were and you almost feel like you're like a blank holy like a blank holy slate like something that's holy something that's beautiful and something that is nothing at the same time that it, that essence is your higher self is the self that's not afraid of death when you tap into that the fear of death goes away at least in, uh, at least to the uh, at least depending on how connected you are with that reality um, and you do that through a meditation process people um, you don't have to go to a retreat but I highly recommend you go to a retreat um, you can meditate on death you could do death meditations you could go on YouTube or you could purchase my course emotional emotional mastery where I talk about that and and those are the things that you have to deal with right um dealing with death dealing with impatience and dealing with with anger um you master that and because think about it even with anger right when you when you fail and you feel impatient and you fail you also feel angry right so what what i'm trying to tell you is that meditation is literally the cure for this i'm not even kidding the problem is is that it doesn't it doesn't take like a five minute meditation it takes you meditating consistently for months you're gonna see results in the first week right but to really be able to lift those that heavy load of fear it takes deepening your meditation practice it's not as easy as it looks but but the beauty is that life is hard you just have to pick what part of life you want to you want to struggle in. It's better to struggle with meditation than to struggle with a drug addiction. It's better to struggle with learning how to meditate for a longer period of time than to struggle on how to make somebody like you that doesn't like you back. You know what I'm saying? So develop a meditation practice and set some goals and try to achieve it because your goals will confront you with these feelings. You can't just try to deal with impatience and not want something. You can't just try to deal with anger and not want something. You can't just have to want to fear with, you just can't deal with fear and not take risk. You gotta do something. So these emotions will arise through your action. So that means that if you meditate for one hour, you're gonna feel impatient. And if you just sit and relax and allow yourself to just feel the emotion and just feel it diligently, diligently, you are bound to be successful like Gwenka says you just sit down and feel it and you just feel yourself wanting to get up and just breathe and remain equ equanimous like equ with equanimity like in the meditation retreat right and what you'll notice is that if you do the meditation properly I, I teach about different forms of meditation in my course but if you just stay meditating for the whole hour and you don't get up that's how you overcome patience and you might think i'm just learning how to meditate no you you're learning how to wait an extra month to buy that thing you're learning how to say no to that person because that person is not good for you you're learning like it's like wax on wax off this is literally wax on wax off people this process that i'm teaching you okay so these three emotions conquer them through accepting them through a meditation process and you'll notice how your life will never be the same. I'm telling you, this is what I did. And for me, this year was all about impatience. I, I learned and I'm still learning how to deal with my impatience, but it's getting better over time. All right. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, you guys know exactly what it